may be seated. I invite you to turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 this morning. Consider the cross. It's the title of the message, 1 Corinthians 15, which 1 Corinthians 15 is all about the resurrection, and the title is Consider the Cross, but without the cross there is no resurrection. So it kind of all fits together quite nicely. So I read uh, the t- our text this morning. The message is verses 1 to 8. And um, as happened earlier, and I'll declare a warning, when I, our text is 1 to 8, but I might not be able to stop at verse 8. I might have to read. Uh, it just 1 Corinthians 15, it's, it's, a, it's the greatest commentary on the resurrection. And um, in Paul's wording, words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So we may read for a while and uh, just look at this, this idea of the resurrection. And then we'll come back and we'll study and take a closer look at verses 1 to 8. Fair enough? 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, or we might say, you can say with that, um, Brethren is kind of a generic, it's brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, So he's literally speaking directly to church folk. He's just to the church in Corinth is who he's writing writing to, and he's talking specifically to believers. He says, I declare to you the gospel, which I did preach to you, and you received in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast to that word in which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was buried, uh, excuse me, and that he was seen by Cephas, and then by the twelve. And then after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, and some have fallen asleep. After that, which after that, he was seen by James, and then by all the apostles, and then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of, due, out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles who I am not worthy to be called an apostle because I, I persecuted the church, the church of God. But, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but it was the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether I was, whether it was I or they, we preached, we preached, so we preached, and so you believed. Now, if Christ is preached that he is risen from the dead, then how is it that some among you say that there's no resurrection from the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen, and if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is empty also. Yes, if we are found, if we are found to be false witnesses, because we testify that God has raised up Christ, in whom, let me, verse 15 again. Yes, if we are found false witnesses of God, because we testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise, for if the dead, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen, and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. <clears throat> and you and the other implication of that is you're still in your sins. So then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. 
if this life, if in, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, then we're all men most pitiful, 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 foolish. But now, but, verse 20, here's the but. But now, Christ is risen from the dead. Amen? And has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep in Christ. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection from the dead. For in Adam all die, even in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, and then after those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God, the Father, and he puts an end to all rule and authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. And that last enemy that will be destroyed is death. We'll stop right there. Verse 26. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 26. The word of the Lord. Father, how we give you thanks. And we give you praise for, for your word. That it's sharp, two-edged sword. It's alive and active. It's powerful. It's profitable. It challenges our thinking. It corrects our thinking. It, gets, it lets us know when we're off path. It gets us back on track with these great things of who you are and in all that you have done according to your purpose, your plan, your pleasure being carried out even right before our very eyes, right even in our midst as we gather this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Just encourage you to um, sometime soon, um, read First Corinthians 15. It's a, it's, it is a great document, if you will, in itself of the, of the resurrection and the description of it and describing it. Um, my favorite part is, one of my favorite parts, I should say, is when it re relates, uses, Paul uses the picture of planting a seed. You know, I take a little corn seed and stick it in the ground the reality is the first thing that happens when you put it in the ground is that seed dies. It has to die so it can sprout. But then when it sprouts, it turns into something much more glorious than the little seed that was put in the ground. You know, how is it that a little seed goes into the ground and then now you got a eight foot stalk with ears of corn coming out of one little, it's just amazing. So it's a picture of the resurrection. We're going to die. We're going to be put in the ground and it's going to sprout the resurrection of life. It's going to be so much more than we can even imagine. And that's a glorious, glorious, wonderful thing in which we, is, our, is the basis of our faith. It's the basis of Christianity. It is why we're here to celebrate. The, we celebrated Easter last week, the resurrection day. This morning would have been a perfect day for sunrise service. Um, but... Any day is a perfect day to celebrate the resurrection, is it not? So this morning, as we before we take a look at uh, um, the first eight verses, um, just a matter of introduction, uh, just commenting on, on devotions this week, and um, where we our our personal choice is the Bible pathways, and we just finished. Um, Joshua's Judges did some did Ruth this week. I think that was the end of 1 Samuel. And it was a couple of interesting notes about that that I noted that uh, may come into part of our discussion today. It's amazing how God does all that. I don't know. It's, it's almost like God's paying attention and just kind of brings you, oh, he is paying attention. Sorry. Um so I was struck uh, uh, March 31st, that was actually that was last Sunday, uh, Ruth, and we read the, read the book, Remember Ruth? And, um, and I just, some of the perspective changes, that's what I love about the Bio Pathways, is it kind of helps you to read the scriptures, gives you background, but also maybe a little bit of a, a perspective, a different perspective. And I never saw 
that uh, Elimelech, which was Ruth's uh, father-in-law, which whether he knew or she knew him or not before he died, but when Elimelech, as, as the story Ruth goes, he goes to, he, there's a famine in the land, so he moves his family to Moab. Which reality, you think about that, it's almost inconceivable that an Israelite would move his family to Moab. I mean, that was like, Carrie's not here, right? So I could say, oh, Lizzie's here. It's like somebody from Evanston moving to New Berlin. It's like, why would you do that? Because you live there. You understand I'm kidding, right? Right, this is just a... It just you, you just didn't, I mean, there, were, there is even laws. You don't even marry the Moabites. You just have nothing to do with them. You know, they were the enemies of people. Here, Elimelech moves to his family, and Bible Pathway points out to the, the perspective on that is really that uh, Elimelech really acted out of self-preservation. self-preservation. You know, uh, set aside the laws of God in order, well, you could almost appreciate that. There's famine in the land. He needs to feed his family. But in violation of the law, and that's kind of one of the perspectives that they brought out, was that uh, what they called misguided belief and how we forge, forge our own path, maybe setting aside the word of God for sake of self-preservation and then justifying it, our path by um, saying how necessary and right it is because... It just seems right at the time. Okay, you folk don't have a problem with that. We can see how Elimelech probably did. We do that all the time, don't we? I mean, this song, "Break the Praise the One Who Breaks the Darkness, the Come Now Font version of it. My favorite line there, maybe because it's so personal and looking in the mirror, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. And, you know, we wander, we wander so, don't we? We wander from this doctrine, this teaching, we wander from this hurt to that hurt, we wander from this perspective to that perspective, and we're just, we're wanderers. We're prone to wander. Anyway, and that's maybe why this passage of Scripture is so important to us today in that context of our, our ability to wander is it gives us that rock stability in which we build our life and which we stand. So it's just uh, what happened at Elimelech happens to all. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a word of God's a mirror and we should see those things. It also reminded me of the Pharisees when Jesus was notoriety, was, he was gaining notoriety and they became very jealous of him because people were following them, following him and not following and, and they said famously, the high priest famously said, well, we don't do something about this. Um, he's he's going to mess up everything that we've built. Rome's going to come in and take all our, our livelihood away. And everything's, and everything's going to, everything's just going to, he's going to wreck everything. He's going to mess with our, we got our, we spent a lifetime lining up the ducks in a row. And this guy's going to come in and he's going to mess up our ducks. And so Jesus does, isn't it? Is it like it when Jesus messes with your ducks? Yeah, I hope you do, because it's called sanctification, right? If we keep on confessing our sins, he's faithful. He's just to keep on forgiving us and cleansing us from all unrighteousness. But acting out of self-preservation, acting out of fear, acting out of anxiousness. We're prone to fear. We're prone to anxious. We're prone to wander. And, um, and we're seeing that in Elimelech. We're seeing that really in our own life. From that. Saul, we got to 1 Samuel and Saul. The instructions were going to Moab and just you, you have to take everybody out. And he didn't. Sa uh, Samuel comes along and says, what's that I hear? I hear sheep blatting. Well, we saved the best sheep for God. Well, that wasn't the instruction. We justify setting aside God's law in order to 
make things necessary and right and many times do that way too many times, do we not? We do prone to wander. And then yes, and then to top all the week off yesterday, for crying out loud, um, looking at David and and uh, and Goliath, and again, Bible pathways fixing a perspective. You know, we we see and they make the point is we usually look at David and Goliath and we see Goliath's size and David's courage and the perseverance, and they're like, that's not what the story's about. <laughs> And I'm like, okay, what is it about? And he says, they, they say, um, yesterday's Bible Pathways, the lesson here is one of simple faith. David believed in God with all his heart, his mind, his soul, and he believed in God's promise to protect and to provide. We, he believed that God would prevail, that God would prevail. And David didn't measure the strength of Goliath against his own strengths, but he measured the strength of Goliath against the power of God and uh, boy what a what a great just simple faith it's just 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 crazy enough to believe God in his promises to provide and to protect man if we would do that uh, just a lot of fear and anxiety and worry and all that would just would just fall by the wayside we just would keep our eyes and on Jesus and consider the cross um, the Bible Pathways went on to say that David looked at the other man, or, the, or 1 Samuel 17, where David stood. He says, you come, says to the Philistine, to Goliath, you come to me with sword and a spear and a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the God of armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. And so it pointed out that David looked at the other man. He didn't see a giant. He didn't see a champion. He didn't see an opponent to be fought. David looked at the Goliath, and he saw a man foolish enough, foolish enough to deny God. And we look at our, 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 the things we worry about today and the things that uh, cause us trouble and fear and, and all the things, the crazy things that are going on in our world, and, and we, we look at all that, and it's like, oh, you know, woe is me. And it's like, wait a minute, let's look at it that way, like David looked at it. He didn't look at the opposition, look at the strength, look at it just, like they're just foolish people, foolish enough to deny God, to turn their back on God. It's no wonder everything's a mess. And to do that, not, not, but not to feel necessarily sorry for them, but to pray for them as well would be a good, exp good perspective to have while we're standing on the rock, which is our relationship with Jesus. The other thing I came across this week, one more I don't mean my front porch to be so big, but um, an article this week I I read and it and I printed it out. I didn't print the author, but the source, um, one of my news feeds. I don't watch the news, but I keep track of the news. Um, uh, the Blaze is where this article came from. Theblaze.com. If you want to find it, the Titan, and, and you'll see why it caught my attention. Richard Dawkins, you know who we're talking about? Richard Dawkins, the what? Yeah, the yeah, the guy that has been going around for decades discrediting Christianity. So here's the title of the article: Richard Dawkins, champion of atheism, mourns Christianity's decline. That got my attention. Can you imagine? So I read the article. And uh, it's, it's, in, it's interesting um, what he influenced. Uh, he, it says here that he, uh, Dawkins lamented the loss of the influence of Christianity, going so far as to declare himself a cultural Christian. What is a cultural Christian? And really what he's mourning, he's not mourning the decline of Christianity. What he's mourning is the, the cultural influences of um, like, uh, hymns and Christmas carols and Christian churches, the, the, the cultural side, which isn't Christianity at all, by the way. So it's not, don't feel sorry for them. Uh, in other words, don't shed any tears for them, the article says. But what it does say is some interesting point is that 
Well, him and they, they're, they're uh, I am pointing out that it does list what is, has been dubbed as the four horsemen, uh, Sam Harris, Daniel Dennant, Christopher Hitchens, and Richard Dawkins, the four. These are like the, the new atheism, the guys that have been, you know, their whole purpose is to discredit Christianity and remove Christianity from public, right? That's who they are. That's what they do. Um, the public Christianity is uh, purged. And so what, what the... What, what the lament is, is it, he's in England and um, is best known for vocal opposition to religion in general, Christianity in particular. And now that public Christianity has been purged from his native Britain, he's surprised that instead of becoming this secular utopia, it is, uh, the country has been slowly the the religious beliefs have been slowly eroded and the ones that he's worked so hard to destroy is he finding out that instead is um this this uh what is called uh a far more instead of being replaced with reason and rationality it's been replaced with a far more extreme denial of reality um and um, and realizing that really Christianity is the foundation of civilization, and so when you get rid of that foundation, you end really end up with anarchy. Clearly, <laughs> duh. <laughs> um, but he wrote a book in 2006, "The God Delusion." Um, he was saw himself as a champion of enlightenment and reason. Uh, and would, he was going to finally purge the last vestiges of religious nonsense from the Western mind and delivering on the true promises of classical liberal theology. Um, called it his mission to end the dominance of the ignorant religion and deliver humanity into a more advanced age. Well, it's, not only is it not working, it doesn't work. Um, even though warned uh, that that doesn't work, he saw it as uh, the warnings as desperate gasp of a dying super superstition that was temp tempt attempting to stay relevant. That's what he called Christianity, and and um, religion is the refuge. Religion was a refuge of the weak and the ignorant, a silly fable of backwoods rubes told their children. Nothing could stop the inevitable march of progress. And the new atheists would become intellectual champions. Well, God has saw, saw fit to that. The article writer calls Dawkins a child clutching a handful of dead flowers that he cut from the roots long ago and is wondering why they're wilting. Assume the traditions that formed his cultural identity were silly and unnecessary that could be discarded without much consequence. Dawkins still celebrates the demise of religion. His lament is that of an old man who is watching the culture that he helped murder pass away, finding himself lonely, cold, and without understanding why. The time of new atheists has come and gone. As a dilution of rational, secular utopia fades <clears throat> into the distance. The article ends with kind of an encouragement but a warning. The future will belong to the faithful. The question is, which faith will guard, guide the future of the West? Will people continue to see the gospel as a stumbling block? Or will they hear the gospel and come to know Jesus? Amen? So with that, with that, why, does, why is this fading into the... Well, the Pharisees said, Why? Of, of Jesus is this if this movement of Jesus is of God you're not going to stop it if it's not of God it's going to fade away and so that's we're just that was said 2,000 years ago it's still true today the secular atheism is not of God and it's fading away and um, 
that which is is of God is not only not fading away, but strengthening in the midst of these things. It's like it's like fear. You know what fear is? Fear is like like a like paper. It looks it looks blocking, <laughs> looks ominous, but it's this is what fear is. It's just paper. So where do we stand? Paul's given us this beautiful, beautiful description of our of our foundation, the foundation of our faith, foundation of our when we put our faith and trust in Christ, foundation of our lives, and the the strength to to be able to go against the oppositions, um, not with fear, not with anxiety, but with a bit of, um, what does it say? It's just like, you know, um, not being offended personally, but that they would offend God would be more important to us. So let's look at the verses, shall we? Moreover, Paul just spent 14 chapters correcting all the tr challenges that were in Corinth, all the problems where they had messed up um, church and church life and church and, and worship, and he just spent 14 chapters. Moreover, on top of all that, brethren, brothers and sisters, fellow believers, I declare to you the gospel, the gospel, the good news. What's interesting about the word gospel, it's a very common name. It, it wasn't it was adopted by Paul to take it to mean the gospel, the good news. It literally means good news, uh, the good news of Jesus Christ. It was taken and made the part of that, but it was a very common word. And it was the gospel which was preached to you, which is also the same root word. So it was like, I, I came to you to evangelize you with the evangelism of the good news of Jesus. Kind of repeating what Paul does all the time anyway, uh, to kind of make his point. But here's the point. He says, I want to, I, it really, I declared this to you, and it carries with it the intent that really Paul's desire is I want, I want you to know this. Know it. <laughs> Not just know about it. There's a difference between knowing about the gospel and knowing the gospel. Knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus is two different things. And um, the, Satan knows Jesus, but it's not under saving faith. We want to know Jesus, not just know him, but know the excellence of the knowledge of him in a personal relationship. He who believes in me, he, Jesus says, I like him to a wise man who hears my word and does them. Now, I'll know in, in, through that relationship. Because other than that, he says, depart from me, I never knew you. We just did Matthew 7 and talked about that. I want to make this known to you. I want to make it clear to you. This is, this is the first things. He says, I deliver to you these first things. The pre that I, that's what I preach to you. And then you received. So, so with that, taking the idea of the four horsemen is I'm going to come back with two more sets of fours for you. Does that sound fair enough? Interesting how this passage kind of, of, well, that's the way I'm going to look at it. Said I, I delivered to you. I declare to you. He says in verse three, "I deliver to you." Um, that's a that's a that the, the that which you received, and you stand and hold fast to. There's your four things. So it's interesting that it's like in the in the uh, the tenses here. As each one of those words is a, a little bit different tense, so it gives us an idea, a little bit more comprehensive view of what it is to come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. First of all, in order to come to know Jesus, number one, first you've got to hear the message. It has to be delivered to you. And that's what Paul's doing. He's delivering the message, and it's, and it's nothing more. He says, it's the message that I received. Verse 3, he says, I declare to you that which I received, which is the, this is the picture, the beautiful picture of discipleship, making disciples. How do you make disciples? Well, you, you, find, you, you, you come to know Christ, and then you find somebody that knows more than you do, learn from them, and what you learn, you find somebody that doesn't know as much as you, and you teach them. And you get in this, get in this, this flow of the gospel, this flow of truth, objective truth, the truth of Scripture, and you just, 
You, 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 you receive it and you pass it on. And that's what Paul is describing here in these few verses. That which I receive, now I'm giving to you. God doesn't give this, us this information for us. He gives it to us for us to give to someone else. And when that, that's how we got to know it because somebody heard it and then told us. And now we've heard it and now we've got to tell somebody else. But at the same time, we're always learning and growing and we're always sharing what we learn to somebody that doesn't know what we know from people that know more than we do. Does that make sense? It's a beautiful picture of discipleship. And here it is, Paul's describing that. That which I received, I received it, and now I'm delivering to you, and you received it. And this is a, this is a statement of uh, you received it. It's a past, it's a statement of fact. It's something that was is received in the past. And, um, and, and, and like, but, but the reality, but the thing is that you've got to receive it. You can't just, you can't just take this information and, put it up on a shelf like little theological trophies like I I, I, I got this I, I got this I understand this or I know this I've heard this you know it's got to you got to take it down you got to receive it and the other implication is is it's something outside of ourselves that we that God brings to that comes from heaven that message through someone else to us is it's something that we don't have that we need and it has to be received like a Christmas gift you get a Christmas gift and it's got your name on it. What's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to rip that bad boy open, right? You got to receive it, and you just you could just leave it set there, wrapped up with your name on it. But at what level does that make sense, right? You got to take it. You got to open it up. You got to put it on. You got to put on the righteousness of Christ, and we try it out, and it fits perfectly. So it's got to be received. There's something outside ourselves. This whole this new age stuff about you just got to stir up what's in you and it's in, it's in you to do what you want to do and just be whatever you want to be. That's new age stuff. That's contrary. That's the exact opposite of Christianity. Christianity is it's outside of ourselves and we receive it. It comes from heaven. It comes from God himself. Jesus himself paid a price for us. He bought the gift and he gives it to us and we've got to open it. We've got to receive it. Something happened in the past. And then he says, in that which you stand. And that, that word stand, to stand on it. And, then, and it's something, it's in the perfect tense, if you will. And it's what in the past, but it carries into the, into the present. It's like we, we receive it, and now this is where we're going to stand. This is where, where, where God's put us. Psalm 40. I was in the miry clay. Miry, miry, I was in the pit. And God picked me up, and he put my feet on a rock. And then he put a song in my heart. And in, in that song, others will see that that other, the probability statement, others will hear that and will come to know Jesus. And, and they, that will, that, that, that we, he takes us, we receive it and he puts us on. We stand there, we stand there. And it's a, something that's completed in the past, but it has these continuing results. And we keep on standing here. We stand and we keep on standing. And, that, and, and, and when we stand on the rock, what happens when we stand on a rock? Matthew 7. The winds blow, the rains come, the floodwaters rise, and the house stands. It's stability. Why? Because it's founded on a rock, which is what? Matthew 7. It's a relationship with Jesus. And so we stand there, and then it says, then it says, and this is really by which you're saved, are being saved. Literally, it says are being saved. And what does that mean? Wait a minute. I thought I was saved when I had my, when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Yes, you were. And you're, you were saved and are being saved. We're, we're saved from the penalty. We're being saved from its influence. And one day we'll be saved from its presence. And, and that our salvation, yes, complete and secure. Uh, and, 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 but the end of it, the finished the finish product, if you will, we call it heaven. And uh, so we're in this, in this being saved. But what's interesting about this word is... We receive it, we, act, we actively receive it, we actively stand on it. This being saved this is not something we do, it's something that's done for us. Right in the tenses of the word, is we're passive, we receive, it's something that comes to us. We have to receive it, we have to stand on it, but it's an offer that comes to us from God, by God. Amen? And then the next, the, 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 the fourth thing, 
Very interesting statement. So what after what I just got through saying, now I say, well, if you hold fast to that word, that almost sounds like very conditional, doesn't it? Well, you're standing there. Well, if I keep standing here, then I'll be saved. That's not what it's saying. What it's saying here. It's not saying, well, you know, I, I was saved and, and I'll, I'll keep being saved as long as I behave myself, as long as I obey the word, then I'll, it, it's not saying that if you don't do that, you'll lose your salvation. It's not what he's saying here. Why? Because in the Greek, uh, Robertson points out very, very masterfully, Robertson word studies, if you will. He said, this is a, this is actually the word if, there's conditions on it, and this is the first class condition of the word if. How do you like that for a definition? Did you write that one down? Right, Pastor? The first class condition of the word if, and it can be translated, maybe should be translated, and because of the because of the construction, since you hold fast to this word. It's in, it's assuming the first class condition assumes that it's a true statement. The, 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 the genuine faith, the gen, it's a description of genuine faith, the ones that are holding fast. It assumes that you, as, having genuine faith, that you're holding fast to that faith. And it's, and it's a, in the present tense, so it's holding fast, right, right to the, right, right, something that's ongoing. We're holding fast, so we're keeping that word. Some, uh, something that assumed that they are holding fast. It's not throwing it into question. It assumes that it's true. Because genuine faith, what? Receives the message, stands on it, and holds fast to it. You see what he's saying there? It's beautiful, beautiful statement. And uh, as you take a look at what Paul's trying to say here. Genuine faith, living by faith, walking by faith. Um, Romans 8.1, there's no condemnation to those who Walk according to the spirit, right? Not according to the flesh. Amen. And this is what I preached to you. And these four things go in a, as a package deal. And as they go into in this packet, package, our belief is not in vain. If he, belief, he says, lest you believe, uh, unless you believe, your belief is in vain, which means empty, unless you have an empty faith. Well, we just had a description of what empty faith looks like if there's no resurrection from the dead. But if we're standing on the resurrection from the dead, our faith is true and solid and good, and we stand on this rock. Let the winds blow. Let the floodwaters rise. They're irrelevant because we're on a rock, which is Jesus, which withstands these storms, these wind tossed to, we're not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. We're standing on the truth of God's word. Amen? beautiful description and how this thing how this is carried out into the life of those who would trust and believe and come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and that, that standing and then another note on that to stand to wrap that first those first four things up it's not just a standing there like <laughs> you know it's a standing it carries with it the the idea of awe it's like wow <laughs> look what Look what Jesus has done for me. Look what, God's, look what God's doing for me. Look what he's going to do for me. Look what he, all this, this it, it carries with it the, the, the truth of, of uh, the reality of, of life, a life with Christ. And it should be, uh, uh, which is where worship comes from, <laughs> standing in awe of the greatness of who God is and all that he has done. So how are these things true? Um, like any, any court of law, there's proof, there's evidence. And the next uh, five verses, one, two, three, four, five, there's, is that five verses? Um, is the evidence that it is true. You only need one, really, the only one piece of evidence you need is an empty tomb. Um, and uh, he's, he, and as the four, descriptions here we had the four um we had the four things above of receiving the gospel and then the four here the four evidences that he died that he was buried that he rose again and that he appeared to many witnesses let's take a look at that in verse three i delivered to you first of all 
or literally I look over to the first things. This is the, this is the fir- these are the first things. This is where it starts. <laughs> this is the this is the bottom line. This is the rubber meets the road. This is this is what holds the holds this foundation together. These are the first things. The first things that to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. These are those first things. What? To believe that to to, to declare which I also received I deliver, I hand it over to you, I deliver to you, I handed it to you, that which I received, what? That Christ died for our sins, number one, that he died. And um, he was, he, contrary to all the speculations, he was dead. Roman soldiers knew how to kill somebody. They knew how to torture somebody, and they knew how to kill somebody uh, in a very long, torturous death. But they also knew, they, they knew when somebody was dead. <laughs> they knew how to prove it. And as you, as you know, um, the, the two fellows that were crucified, rightfully so, r- crucifixion was a common form of execution in that day. Um, it's interesting that God had to wait until first century um, Roman culture to lift Jesus up as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Like he couldn't come today to do that because we don't lift, never mind. In the fullness of time, God sent a son, amen? He died. The two, the two guys on the outside, they were at the end of the afternoon, they're like, wait a minute. We got to get these guys off the cross because the Sabbath's coming. What hypocrisy! We got to stop. We got to get these guys dead so we can get them off, so we can celebrate the Sabbath. Unbelievable. Anyway, so they, because crucifixion was supposed to really literally the last couple of days, but we got to get this thing done. Two guys on the outside were still alive. That's why they broke the legs, so it would hasten the death. Because you, what you died in crucifixion was sus- suffocation. You couldn't breathe anymore. You couldn't push up to breathe if your legs are broken. But they came to Jesus, and they see that he was already dead, but they didn't kill him because Jesus what? Gave up his spirit, right? Which even the process of crucifixion, it proves that Jesus gave up his spirit rather than the crucifixion killing him because he would have lasted several days crucifixion or they would have broke his legs but interestingly enough psalm 22 says not a bone of his body was broken so we take bread and we break we break the bread so we can share it but it's not to represent a broken body because not a bone of his body was broken to fulfill scripture according to jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures amen so they knew how to they knew how to make sure somebody was dead Rather than break, they thought he, was, he looks dead, let's check it out. They didn't break his legs, but they put a spear in his side. And that water and blood that came out was the physiological medical evidence of a ruptured heart, ruptured lungs, of which he carried, you can imagine carrying the weight of the sin of mankind would do such a thing too. But it says that he died for your sins, for our sins, literally on our behalf. He died for us. He died on behalf of us. He literally instead of us. That's the essence of our of our faith. That's the essence. This is foundation. This rock that we stand on. That Jesus died in our place. He died instead of us on our behalf, and it was all according to God's plan, according to God's purpose. Even Peter in Acts two called it the determined counsel of Almighty God. This was God's plan, all according to Scripture. And that he was buried, and that he, um, and that he um, was, was raised. Um, the New King James says he was, verse 4, he was buried, and that he rose again the third day. Literally, it's, um, it's to be read that he has been raised. Again, perfect tense, completed action is done. He has been raised on the third day. That, uh, the very specific title for a very specific reason, the third day. Why? Because it was according to scriptures. 
So he died, he was buried, he has been raised from the dead. And then number four, he was, uh, has that he has, uh, says in verse five, has been seen, has appeared, his appearances um, to, um, and, and Paul lists a couple of them here. The reality that we, there's, there was ten, 10 times Jesus appeared in his resurrected form. We know that he appeared before Mary, uh, the other women on the morning um, of, the, of Easter morning, the Sunday morning. We know that he appeared to the two men on the road to Emmaus. Um, he appeared to Peter on his own. Um, he appeared in the, um, the ten apostles when um, Thomas wasn't there, the eleven the others. Um, he appeared to the, the, the 12, the disciples, because Judas wasn't, Judas killed himself, and so they replaced him. But he appeared to the disciples on the ascension. Uh, when he ascended, he was with his disciples. Uh, seven of them by the sea when he had breakfast with them. Um, he says that he met with James, his brother, Pastor James. And then by 500, it also is verse 6. He was seen by over 500 brethren, brothers and sisters, believers at once. Uh, a pre predetermined meeting, by the way. Go to Galilee, I'll meet you. And uh, he did. 500 eyewitnesses. That's some pretty, pretty solid evidence. Um, I used to say, I used to date myself by saying, if we had one eyewitness to what happened in Los Angeles with O.J. Simpson, that whole mess, all that, all that was, would, would have gone away with just one eyewitness. Here we have 500 witnesses at one time seeing Jesus alive. It's a lot of evidence, it's some pretty significant evidence. In fact, Paul says here in the, in the verse 6, he said, 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remains until present, but some have fallen asleep. What does that mean? He says some of, some of these people are, at the time of Paul writing 1 Corinthians, which is around early the, the 60s, uh, you know, the 60s. Anyway, not those 60s, a few years, other 60s ago. Sorry, I digress. Boy, isn't that funny how your mind just goes, yeehaw. Um, what he's saying here, there's some of these, when he's writing this, he's like, some of those 500 people are still alive. Like this letter, this, le this transcript that we have of this letter is within the lifetime of Jesus' resurrection. And he's like, some of them are still alive. Listen, if you don't believe me, go talk to them. They're still alive. You go interview them. You go talk to them, those eyewitnesses, and see what they say. It's what he's saying. He's challenging them. If you don't believe me, don't believe that there's 500 of them? Well, you go talk to them, and they'll tell you there's 500 of us, and we saw him. He was alive. We saw him dead. Put him, we saw him put in the tomb, but we've seen him alive. That's some pretty good evidence. That would hold up in a court of law. How does it hold up in your court? Is that evidence enough for you? People want evidence? Here's some evidence. Right? Case for Christ. You know, Lee Strobel? He was going to prove once and for all the resurrection was a hoax. By the end of his, his uh, investigation, he came to know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior and put his heart and belief in the resurrection of Jesus Christ because it's true. It's a historic fact. Paul says, go check it out. And then he says, but some of them have fallen asleep. Right? We read that in Scripture, and, we always, and I always have to say, those that have died in Christ. That's what that means. They've fallen asleep. They don't, it's this isn't soul asleep. They just kind of like pass out until Jesus comes back and wake up again. This is, this is a euphemism to mean death. But I, and that's why we keep studying the Bible because like we read these things over and over again. You start digging into the stuff. I came across this very interesting piece of fact that goes along with this word, a word study uh, of this word falling asleep is to the idea, why, did they, why didn't they just say those that died in Christ? It would have saved me from having to say, well, it just means that they died in Christ. It doesn't mean that it's souls. Why did they use falling asleep? 
the idea is, and the reason what car- that word carries with it, that it carries with it the hope of the resurrection. Is what really what it looks like. Is like we're asleep now, but we'll be raised again. That death isn't the final answer. It, the, the last enemy of death has been defeated, and the, the idea that they have fallen asleep, that have died in Christ, carries with it that they'll be raised to new to, to life one day. Isn't that great? Isn't that a great word? And that's our that's the hope. That's the rock in which we stand, and it's authenticated uh, with these. Um, Paul just laying out some of the some of the evidence, and then he goes on to say, "If Christ didn't rise from the dead, then we're all fools for following this and doing all these things we do." But the reality is, verse twenty: Christ is risen from the dead. Let's celebrate that with the bread and the cup. Heavenly Father, we come to the communion table this morning, uh, hearing these words, your words of life, the words of these living words, these powerful words. These very, very sharp, two-edged sword words that, Father, that can just clear, clear out all the, all the noise and clear out all the distractions and just leave us considering the cross and looking to Jesus and that he died for our, died on our behalf. He took the penalty for our sins, that he's, by the transformative work of the Holy Spirit in our life today, that we're being delivered from sin's influence in that process of being growing away from from that, but yet still looking forward to the one day when you'll deliver us from its presence. And what a day, phew, what a day that'll be. No more, no more sin, no more death, no more tears, no more regret, no more just ever, ever enjoying you. But even now, by your living grace, your powerful grace, your inexhaustible grace, your, 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 the wonder of your grace, we can experience that, your very presence and your very strength and your, your forgiveness and, the, and the, the power of your presence, even now, as we gather the table to take a piece of bread. We've broken up the bread um, to... To share it, um, but to, as it represents um, the willingness of Christ to carry out your plan according to the scriptures and your determined counsel, your determined purpose, your pleasure being carried out on the cross on our behalf, dying for our sins that, and to paying the penalty for that, that we, can, that we can know you personally, that we can enjoy you and grow in the grace and knowledge of our own Savior, Jesus Christ, and be then to be able to share it with us, to pass that information on, that which I received, I deliver, and I give you thanks and praise for this. Celebrate, as we celebrate it together, celebrate, cause our celebration to be acceptable in your sight, for Christ's sake, in Jesus' name, amen.
glad he sat with his, his friends at um, the Last Supper. He, he took this bread and um, he broke it and he said to them that this is his body to be broken for them. And this, this weekend I, I heard it said about his um, sixth statement on, on the cross as he, he goes to speak. He has to push himself up on the, on the nail on his feet so, just so that he could get enough breath. And so as he's pushing up and his back is against the, the grain of the wood and probably splinters going into the, the cuts and he's shoving as the nail is pushing onto his feet, he says, it is finished. And it wasn't a, a finish like defeat, but it was a, a finish of celebration of we are paid for. So he says, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. died on the same day as, as Passover for the Jewish nation and during Passover what they would do is they would slit the throat of the lamb and take the blood and that would be payment for them and guess what the priests would say it is finished and so as they're saying that for their temporary fix Jesus is saying for our permanent everlasting fix so he says take drink this is my blood poured out for you So, um, as you know, it's our habit to uh, few of us have breakfast during the week, and Jim brings a, morning Jim, brings a devotion to us. Coincidence, this last week's devotion, stand, stand in the spirit. Co coincidence. Oh. <laughs> you want to? You, yeah, yeah. No, that's the name of it. But, yeah, if you want to, Stand. As soon as I read this, we're going to sing. So, yeah, stand in the spirit. If you are the verse, this is Charles Stanley. Stanley, right? Um, if, if you're reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed. 
Let me say that again. If you're reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. 1 Peter 4, 14. <clears throat> Speaking of prone to wander, the night of the Lord's Supper, Peter told Jesus, Lord, I am ready to go both to prison and to death with you. And it was a courageous declaration, but a short time later, not very much, a very short time later, Jesus, as Jesus was struggling, struggled in prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, that Peter could not stay awake long enough to intercede for the one he, he called Master. And his resolve was further weakened after, after Jesus' arrest when Peter denied Jesus three times. And then the time came for him to stand for the Lord, and Peter folded. What happened? It was simply wasn't within his ability, in his ability to stand, withstand the attack of the enemy. He relied on his own limited strength, and he failed. However, the good news is in the book of Acts that Peter was completely trans forgiven and transformed because of God's spirit was alive within him, empowering to him to stand firm. In other words, he could hold on to God because the Lord held on to him. Isn't that a great statement? And the power that you have in Christ is all you need to endure the fiercest battles, the deepest sorrows, the, longer, the longest waits. What Peter could not do on his own, God did mightily, or Peter did what he could not do on his own, he did mightily in the Holy Spirit and you can too. Amen. Jesus, strengthen me by your spirit and stand firm as I stand firm for you. Amen. Lawson likes to say that we are thankful for Jesus' perfect life, his sacrificial substitutionary death, and for his victorious resurrection. Victory in Jesus. 353 in your hymn book.